It's 5 p.m. here in Moscow. You're with RT International and today's news and the week's big stories. Dozens of civilians, including children, are falling victim to Saudi-led coalition airstrikes in Yemen against the advancing Houthi rebels. We've got the latest on that big story in the week. Also coming up too... I believe they have realised that sanctions, pressure and an agreement will not go together. World diplomats still immersed in weekend-long Iran nuclear talks with all sides reporting progress and sticking points to engage the latest. And NATO hardware is paraded across Eastern Europe, but locals say they're worried instead of being wowed. Hello, it's Kevin Owen with you this hour. Very good to have your company. Our top story then, civilian casualties are increasingly falling victim to the Saudi-led coalition strikes in Yemen. Human Rights Watch has confirmed that children are among the victims too there now. Saudi Arabia intervened following the ousting of the Sunni-backed President Hadi by the Shiite rebels amid raging sectarian violence ongoing in the region. <laughs> Some of the scenes from the week there, but the Houthis who now control the capital and several provinces too remain defiant despite the bombardment, even though the uh, coalition bombardment has gathered significant global support too. We'll see how significant by looking at the map here. As well as Saudi Arabia and seven of its Gulf allies, Pakistan and Egypt are also... Uh, uh, taking part in the operation and uh, Turkey as well said it will also consider getting involved uh, and the US as well is already providing intelligence talking of the US Washington has been involved in Yemen for years in fact but the strategy that was held as a success by President Obama just last year as you can see now is to send it into all-out conflict Lebanon-based political commentator Marwa Osborne spoke to us and believes the current crisis highlights the failure of American diplomacy in Yemen. Obama actually ordered his troops to leave the southern bases in Yemen. First of all, I think what the U.S. has learned and uh, very difficultly, uh, if I may, uh, that uh, actually supporting Ab uh, Abdurrabu Mansour Hadi, the former Yemeni president, was a mistake. He fled uh, Sana'a, he went down to Aden, uh, and he declared that Aden is the new capital, which was uh, not. Uh, Hadi had more pressure from the U.S. and from Saudi Arabia as well to keep on uh, standing against uh, the Houthis, and which, which led to, to what we are seeing right now in Yemen. So. The U.S. has definitely uh, learned that standing by a former president who does not have the support of the public is a very bad idea. Well, the situation is so layered, so complex, so dangerous in Yemen right now. U.S. foreign policy paints a complex picture of the Middle East at the moment with friend and foe often hard to discern. Take a look at the news wall. Shia Houthis in Yemen share similarities with some militias fighting in Iraq too. They are all pro-Iran, and it's rumoured indeed that they're being directly influenced by Tehran. Yemeni rebels are fighting al-Qaeda, while Iraqi militias are battling Islamic State terrorists. There's one big difference, though. While the U.S. is backing the bombing of Shias in Yemen, it's simultaneously arming similar groups in Iraq. U.S. defence analyst Ivan Ellen says Washington puts its national interest, then, over consistency. Most of these cases, uh, countries react to their interests. And in the case of Yemen, the person that's been removed is the person that the U.S. was supporting. This is an inconsistency, but that's uh, what's happening because of the political realities of which side the U.S. is on. And, and it's quite strange in some cases. Really, the undergirding policy, there's two pillars of Middle Eastern policy, even though it seems confusing. One is support for Israel, and the other one is oil. 
And of course, the Persian Gulf states, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and then the other Gulf states, they have a lot of oil. That's one of the reasons that U.S. policy is like it is. And Yemen has the possibility of destabilizing Saudi Arabia. So I think that's why the U.S. is concerned about that. We have more on our website about how the airstrikes in Yemen might develop into a fully-fledged ground operation too, keeping a close eye on it over the next few days. Also there as well insight into how the US is effectively harming the fight against al-Qaeda in Yemen by backing the Saudi strikes. Now, there's no weekend rest at all for some of the world's top diplomats. They're still hard at work in Switzerland to try and secure that nuclear deal with Iran. Russia's foreign minister is on his way there too. Representatives from six world powers, that's the US, Britain, France, Germany, Russia and China, are holding this marathon set of talks in Lausanne. The deadline they've set to reach a preliminary deal is just a couple of days away now, the 31st of the month. Now, if they do reach agreement, it could end a 12-year-long bitter row. For their part, Iran's foreign minister uh, saying Tehran has already made its decision. Now the ball is in America's court. Iran has made a decision, uh, a political decision, to go for engagement with dignity. Uh, I believe our uh, negotiating partners also uh, need to make this decision. I, I believe they have realized that sanctions, pressure and an agreement will not go together. While it's down to the wire, our correspondent Daniel Bushel is closely watching these talks and ongoing in Switzerland for us. The atmosphere here at the hotel where the talks are taking place certainly marks a sea change from previous years. Looking at the photos of the talks, we can tell there's been a thaw in relations. France's foreign minister said this? Iran has the right to a nuclear program, but not bombs. His German counterpart, Frank Walter Steinmeier, added the goal is in sight, but we don't know if we can reach it. The EU foreign relations chief warns we've done more than ever, but still much to work on. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry even claims without this deal, Iran will be out of control. He said he doesn't see any alternative to an agreement and doesn't expect continued sanctions to work. He's also reportedly ready to allow Iran to run its centrifuges as long as they don't enrich uranium, which can be used for weapons. Tehran's foreign minister cast a reassuring tone, though, adding, we've chosen to go for the deal, but there is no place for the existing crippling sanctions against his population. Russia's foreign minister is expected to fly in today ahead of the possible deal. We'll be keeping a close eye on developments throughout the day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, these negotiations uh, were all but unthinkable just a couple of years ago. Iran said to endure almost a decade of intense Western pressure to halt its uranium enrichment program with wave after wave of sanctions being imposed. It's crippled its economy. Fears, though, of a nuclear armed Tehran were summed up by Israel's Prime Minister with that memorable bomb picture that he drew. Remember that, that cartoon? He produced that at the UN General Assembly back in 2012. A year later, Iran's uh, president got a frosty reception in New York, too, while addressing the UN for the first time. But after that, things did seem to change. The tide started to turn, leading to a completely different picture, basically where we are now. Barack Obama phoned President Rouhani for what was the first direct conversation between the two countries' leaders in more than 30 years. Iran and the world powers then agreed to meet in Geneva in 2013 when that historic interim agreement was reached. And they've been regularly meeting since, and a number of American and EU sanctions have been suspended as a result. However, of course, Israel's Prime Minister says the deal that's on the table with Iran will be a disaster and that uh, it's even worse than he'd been expecting. Benjamin Netanyahu had repeatedly warned the U.S. against compromising with Tehran, saying that it would lead, he worries, to a Middle East arms race. Washington, though, has a plan to eat his concerns, as Artie's been hearing from the president of the American-Iranian Council. I believe the U.S. playing a very sophisticated game with Iran, and that is it is trying to disarm Iran of its nuclear program to begin with. It's going to make Iran make commitments to a nuclear deal and then uh, walk away uh, from its own commitment and, and impose on Iran other demands. So I think uh, what the U.S. is telling Israelis and, and Saudis is that, listen, wait until I get this deal and then you will see what happens thereafter. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure if that, that, that thereafter is at all good for Iran. Stay with RT if you can to keep up to date with those ongoing talks in Switzerland. We'll be across it for you with the latest developments and breakthroughs as they emerge. Right here.
So we'll see where we go. Let's take in more of the news now that's shaped the last seven days, and it's been a week of brutal standoffs between Canadian police and students in the biggest cities of the Quebec province. see the end result there are some of those clashes in the week students had gathered to protest against budget cuts which they say would hit the education and health sectors worst massive rallies were seen in Quebec City and Montreal where police declared the protests illegal arresting scores of demonstrators activists and rally witnesses though told us they thought the police reaction was unreasonably brutal the march that was outside of my house on Tuesday night, that was a march of, of only about 100 students. There was another march in town of another 100 or so students, and um, the students were extremely peaceful. They were all arrested. The police kept them in the streets. It was about minus, it felt like minus 14, uh, and they were stuck in the streets for about three hours. Uh, we've rarely seen this level of brutality in a province which normally has been uh, uh, taking the, to the streets uh, many times a year and is used to, uh, to social activism. We've very rarely seen this level of repression before. Uh, you know, the protesters, from what I have seen, they haven't done anything as crazy as a few years earlier when we had uh, protests against tuition and there, were a lot of, uh, van and there was a lot of vandalism going on. But uh, the police are just using a lot of force, tear gas and uh, the pepper spray, a lot of, a lot of force against uh, the protesters. Coming up, chilling details from the voice recorder from that crashed German wings plane have helped investigators swiftly establish what happened on that doomed flight. It's allowed prosecutors to build a timeline of the final terrifying minutes of a tragedy that killed 150 people in the week. We've got more on that a little later in the programme. Coming up too, the Ukrainian conflict draws attention of video game